All right, everybody, buckle up, because today we're going for a wild ride. We're diving into Einstein, relativity, the whole shebang. It's a deep dive, for sure. But you know what's amazing? We're going straight to the source. Einstein actually wrote a book, you know, explaining this stuff for everyday people. Yeah, no physics PhD required for today's adventure. We're talking about those aha moments that blew Einstein's mind. And let's be honest, they're about to blow ours too. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. And you know how he starts the book? It's surprisingly simple. He's talking about, like, basic geometry, making sure everyone's on the same page before he, well, before he bends our minds. Okay, see, that's what I like to hear. A little grounding before the liftoff. But speaking of grounding... He gets into this stuff about how our everyday intuitions about the world are not always so reliable. Yeah. Okay, I'm all ears. Give me an example. What do you mean? Okay, so, imagine you're on a train, right? And you drop, like, a little pebble just straight down. See, it's pretty straightforward so far. Well, here's the thing. Whether you're watching that pebble from inside the train or you're standing on the platform, that pebble is going to look like it's moving totally differently. Ah, so it's all about perspective. That's exactly it. Einstein's big point is there's no one right answer for how that pebble falls. It all depends on, like, your own personal frame of reference, which, when you think about it, is kind of huge because it means there isn't one single correct view of the universe. Whoa, okay. So we're already messing with the idea of, like, one fixed reality. Right. And it just keeps going. Yeah. Because once you accept this whole relative motion thing, you can't help but rethink something else that feels really yeah. basic. Time. Okay, yeah. This is where my brain starts doing backflips. <laughs> Time, you know? <laughs> it's like, the one constant ticking away for everyone the same, or is it? Right. It feels so obvious. But then Einstein throws in this curveball called the relativity of simultaneity. So picture this. A super long train, okay, lightning strikes at both ends at the exact same time. Okay, I'm picturing it. This is already dramatic. Now, someone standing next to the tracks, they might see those strikes and be like, yep, happened at the same time. But someone <laughs> on the train, especially if they're moving towards one strike and away from the other. They wouldn't see it the same way. Nope. <laughs> to them, one lightning strike would happen before the other. Hold up. Are you saying my now isn't the same as your now? That's what Einstein's getting at. He even walks you through the math, and honestly, it's not even that bad. But the point is, there isn't some universal clock we're all synced up to. Our experience of time, it's totally tied to how we're moving compared to everything else. Okay, I think I need a minute to process this, yeah. seriously. But I have a feeling this leads to, you know, the big one. The thing everyone knows Einstein for. That whole cosmic speed limit business. You got it. It's all connected. Think about how we normally figure out speeds, right? Like, if you throw something forward while you're on that moving train... This is adding speeds together, yeah. right? Speed of the train, yeah. plus how fast you threw it. Simple. Right, seems simple. But Einstein figured out this breaks down when you're talking about light. He's like, nope, speed of light, that's the constant. He even gave it a special letter, C. And no matter how fast you're moving, even if you could somehow chase a beam of light, that light's always going to be moving away from you at, you guessed it, the speed of light. Wait, hold on. So no matter what you do, how fast you go, the speed of light never changes. You got it. Like a hard limit for the entire universe. Yeah. And it completely changed how we understand physics. So it's like Einstein looked at everything everyone knew about the universe, and he was like, yeah, you're all playing the wrong game. Pretty much. And this new game... Yeah, it has some really, really weird rules. Like, time itself can slow down if you're moving near the speed of light. Okay, my brain officially just went through a wormhole. Time can mm -hmm. slow down. It's called time dilation, and it's one of the wildest things about Einstein's special relativity. But to really get what it means, we got to talk about something even bigger than time. Gravity. You know, it's funny you should mention gravity because Einstein, he actually starts talking about it in a really unexpected way. He brings up these at the spherical beings that live on the surface of a sphere. Spherical beings. Okay, now you're just making stuff up, right? I'm serious. It's in the book. He uses it as this whole thought experiment to show how curved space works. So these beings, right, they can only travel on the surface, no up or down for them, just forward, backward, left, right. Their whole universe is curved. Okay, I think I'm kind of getting it. Yeah. Now, imagine these guys start drawing triangles, you know, tr tr trying to figure out geometry. They find out pretty quick that the angles, they don't add up to 180 degrees like we're used to because, well, their surface isn't flat. Ah, uh, okay. I see where you're going with this. 
Maybe. That's how Einstein starts cracking open this whole gravity thing. Yeah. Because, see, before him, everyone thought about gravity like Newton did, right? Yeah. Some mysterious force pulling things together across space. Right. Apples falling, planets orbiting. The usual. Exactly. But Einstein's like, hold on a minute. Mm. What if gravity isn't a force at all? What if it's all about the shape of space-time itself? Shape of space-time. Okay, now you got to explain this one. You got it. Remember those spherical beings and their weird triangles? Well, Einstein realized that anything with mass, anything with energy, it actually does something similar to space-time. It warps it, kind of like bending a giant sheet. So instead of the Earth pulling on me with this invisible force, it's more like it's making a dip in space-time, and I'm just falling into it. You got it. That's like the classic example is a bowling ball on a trampoline, right? Makes a nice little dip. Well, Einstein's saying planets, stars, they're doing that to space-time, making these gravitational wells that tell everything else how to move. Okay, I actually kind of get that analogy. So not a force, a warp. Man, this is wild. And it gets even trippier because once you start thinking about gravity this way, you got to ask, what about the whole universe, right? Like, is it finite? Does it have an edge? Right, right. Like, if you kept going in one direction, would you hit a wall? Well, get this. Einstein's equations, at first, they seem to suggest the universe is finite, but unbounded. Like those spherical beings, you could travel forever and end up back where you started, but never actually reach a boundary. Whoa, okay. So not a wall but it still wraps around. Exactly. But hold on, because it gets even wilder. See, as much as Einstein liked this whole finite universe idea at first, his equations, they allowed for something else too. A universe that wasn't just sitting there, but actually expanding. Wait, you mean getting bigger? Like the whole thing? You got it. Like a balloon inflating, but on a cosmic scale? Of course, this idea, it was pretty out there, even for Einstein. He kind of resisted it at first, even tried to tweak his equations to make the universe stay put. So even Einstein wasn't always stoked on where his own ideas led. Exactly. And you know what's really interesting? He later called that attempt to force a static universe his biggest blunder. It took a while, and the work of some other physicists, like this guy Alexander Friedman, before the expanding universe really took hold. So it was like the universe itself had to provide more evidence to convince everyone, even Einstein. Exactly. And yeah. that brings us to one of the most mind-blowing implications of all this, something that, again, Einstein wasn't initially too keen on, the idea that the universe had a beginning, what we now call the Big Bang. Okay, so we've gone from a pebble on a train to like the entire history of the universe. That's a lot to take in. But tell me more about this Big Bang thing. Did Einstein's work actually say, hey, the universe had a beginning? Well, it's not quite that straightforward. His theories, they laid the groundwork, definitely. But Einstein himself, he wasn't exactly the president of the Big Bang fan club. You know, <laughs> at least not at first. A lot of physicists back then, they liked the idea of a universe that was just always there, stable, eternal. So how do we get from Einstein's not so sure to Gross. boom, Big Bang's the way to go? Evidence, my friend. Observations and other scientists putting the pieces together. Remember that guy Friedman we talked about? Yeah, the yeah. expanding universe guy? Well, his work, plus astronomers actually seeing galaxies moving away from each other, that's what really made the Big Bang stick. So like the universe itself was giving hints, and then it all clicked. Exactly. And you know what? Even Einstein, he came around eventually. He accepted the Big Bang idea, which, I don't know, I kind of love that. Even Einstein got to adjust his thinking when the evidence shows up. Pretty humbling, right? Totally. Shows that science isn't about being right all the time. It's about, like, following the trail wherever it leads. 100%. And speaking of trails, Einstein's work, it didn't just shake up gravity and the whole universe thing. It did something crazy to how we think about light itself. Oh, yeah. Didn't he say something about gravity bending light? Yeah. That always sounded more like Star Wars stuff to me, you know? It does, right. Mm. But it's totally real. Remember how we were talking about mass and energy, warping space-time? Well, Einstein's like, hold on, that warping affects everything, even light. So a beam of light is cruising along, minding its own business, right? Comes in here a big old star. That light's going to bend because space-time itself is bent around that star. So like a cosmic curveball for light beams. That's it. And this prediction, as wild as it sounds, they actually proved it. Back in 1919, there was a solar eclipse. And astronomers, they measured the light from distant stars bending around the sun, exactly like Einstein said it would. It was a huge deal, made him a superstar, and really kind of sealed the deal for his theories. Wow, that's incredible. So basically, but taking these simple things, motion, time, gravity, questioning everything we thought we knew, Einstein opened up these whole new ways of understanding the universe. 
stuff no one had even imagined before. And that's what's so amazing about his work. It wasn't just math, you know. It was about changing how we see ourselves, how we see our place in this whole vast, mysterious cosmos. Absolutely. And I think that's a great place to leave it today. We've covered some seriously mind-blowing territory, but really it all comes back to staying curious, right? Never being afraid to ask what if. That's what it's all about, because who knows? The more we ask those what if questions, the more we might uncover about the universe and, and really ourselves. So to everyone listening out there, we'll leave you with this. If our ideas about time and space, things we thought were so solid, can be turned upside down, what other mysteries are out there? Just waiting for someone to ask the right question. What will you discover?